about what other people are doing. So I'm really happy to see the turnout today. So if it ends panel, before 12, call me so I can pick up the here pick before, up the so we'll number, 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 come back number. because it's really good information that's coming down the pipe. And extension should be proud. And we should support each other with uh, the endeavors that we're undertaking in our jobs. So um, today's program is Connecticut Climate Adaptation Academy, uh, municipality, uh, working with municipalities on climate change. Uh, clearly, this is a critical topic, and um, especially uh, things that are happening in recent days may influence it even further. So we really need an educated population and educated, educated municipalities and others so that we can really drive home the point that it is a real uh, phenomenon that is really occurring and so that we can all learn how to address it uh, as best we can. So today we have two presenters. We have Juliana Barrett and uh, Bruce Hyde. I'm going to do the introductions. Bruce will be speaking first. I'm going to do both introductions and then uh, turn it right over to the, uh, the people who have the interesting information to share. So uh, Juliana Barrett is with University of Connecticut Sea Grant College Program in the Department of Extension. Her work focuses on climate adaptation and resilience, as well as coastal habitat management and restoration, working with Connecticut's municipalities, NGOs, and state and federal partners. She has developed numerous tools and websites for coastal residents on native plantings and coastal habitat. Prior to coming to Sea Grant in 2006, congratulations on your 10 years, um, she worked as a consultant and also for the Nature Conservancy as the director of Connecticut River Tidelands Last Great uh, Places program. She has a doctorate in plant ecology from the University of Connecticut and is co-author of The Vegetation of Connecticut. She recently celebrated her 10-year anniversary with the University. and Bruce Hyde. Uh, he is a land use educator with the University of Connecticut and primarily responsible for coordinating the Land Use Academy. In addition, he provides technical assistance to communities in a variety of areas including affordable housing, climate change, adaptation, and community outreach. Mr. Hyde is an AICP certified planner with over 30 years of ex experience as a regional and municipal planner, a community development director in Vermont, and a municipal planning and Development Director, Zoning Enforcement Officer, and Planning Consultant in Connecticut. He has served as a Chairman of the South Hero Vermont Planning Commission. Prior to his UConn appointment, Mr. Hyde worked for an international consulting firm based out of New Haven. He is a member of several local boards and committees, and I welcome you both. Thank you for the opportunity to be here and talk about the Climate Adaptation Academy, which um, was the brainchild of Juliana Barrett. She's the one who originally came up with it. Uh, and she performs, besides coming up with the idea and helping develop and run it, uh, she um, performs the very important function of keeping me sane <laughs> when I try to deal with navigating the various university bureaucratic processes and uh, other things that get me incredibly frustrated. You may think that I'm uh, asleep here. Uh, I'm actually pounding my head on the desk <laughs> because of the recent choice of EPA administrator by President-elect uh, Donald Trump. So the, uh, the Green Use Academy was originally uh, modeled after, excuse me, the Climate Adaptation Academy was originally modeled after the Land Use Academy, which is targeted toward local land use commissioners. That's where a lot of local land use decisions are made. Uh, and uh, we thought that that would be a good target audience to start to broach the subject of climate adaptation and what needs to be done at the municipal level. But as we got out talking to people in the community and we talked to a whole bunch of communities, we learned very quickly that there was a, a, a series of events that perhaps had um, brought uh, a level of concern to communities and those included things like the um, Excuse me, October snowstorm, which is also known as Frankenstorm, Tropical Storm Irene, Tropical Storm Sandy, and another other less of tropical storms that caused some serious problems. Is that a picture from Connecticut? Yes, that's Milford. And that's a tropical storm. So one of the things we learned talking with the folks out uh, in the communities was that there was a lot of um, issues that came up that they were uncertain about. And I think that perhaps uh, former Secretary of Defense, uh, Donald Rumsfeld, mm -hmm. said it best. And he wasn't talking about climate change, he was talking about this, but uh, he did say in this profound uh, statement that 
as we know, there are things, there are known knowns, things we know we know. We also know that there are known unknowns, so that is to say, we know there are some things we don't know, but there are also some unknown unknowns, the ones we don't know, we don't know. Um, and that is, it, it sounds crazy, but it's really true when you when, when apply to climate change. There's, there are a lot of things that we know we don't know, but we also, I think, know that there are things out there where there, that we know that there are things out there that we don't know we don't know, um, if you can follow that. Uh, and after talking with all these communities and realizing what concerns they had, we came to the conclusion that we needed to sort of come up with a new strategy rather than just targeting local land use commissions. And uh, part of that was determining what the concerns of the communities were and um, what best practices we would uh, need to engage in in order to address those concerns. The internet's a wonderful thing, and sometimes it's a curse. And in the case of climate adaptation, it might actually be a curse, because there's so much information out there, communities really don't know what to use, uh, what standards to use, what to use for sea level rise, uh, what areas are going to be flooded. So we're trying to sift through all of that information and bring some clarity to all of that. Um, right now, we're still a little bit confused ourselves, but the goal is to bring clarity to that. And the other important function of the Climate Adaptation Academy is to act as an exchange of ideas and um, uh, strategies about how to deal with climate adaptation. And uh, that's a, we think is a very, very important function, is to act as that conduit for the exchange of information. So just to give you an idea of the kind of things we found uh, the communities need when we're out there. Um, this is a partial list, and I'm not going to read this all to you. Uh, we have an expression around the office called uh, death by PowerPoint, <laughs> and that's where somebody puts up a bunch of words on, on the screen and then reads them to you. But the things that we sort of knew were out there were, were flooding and shoreline protection, storm surge, and that sort of thing. But other issues that came up were things like legal issues, uh, impacts on real estate and businesses, um, and one of the things that we, we, I just talked about was what data to use. Uh, there's a lot of concern about that. Uh, storm surge and impacts on transportation systems and those sort of things. So we had this grandiose idea that we were going to be all things to all people and we were going to cover all of these topics in some way. Um, we very quickly came to realize that that was impossible and started focusing in on a few of these issues up here and decided to do a good job at, at doing those issues rather than doing a mediocre job doing a lot of them. So we have to date, uh, since uh, February 2014, uh, held nine Climate Adaptation Academy sessions in the areas we've chosen to focus in on. 700 attendees from 64 towns and four states. Um, general climate adaptation, flooding, uh, emergency preparedness, uh, and technology. Emergency responders. One thing that we found with that is that there's a bunch of of different um, levels of uh, ability to respond to post-storm events amongst communities. Some communities use GIS, and they're really good at identifying problem areas and taking them off the list of problem areas when they're cleared. And there are other communities that are barely at the point of using flip phones uh, to, to deal with that. So uh, the other, I think, very, very interesting point of that, because we had people from the state down with that, so there seems to be a real disconnect between the folks at the local level and the folks at the state level. And out of that um, session did come a commitment to try and bridge that gap that existed. Uh, living shorelines one, two, and three, and I will let Juliana, because that's something we're going to focus on a little bit more later on. Um, I'll let her go over all of that. Legal issues, I'm going to focus in a little bit more on what we do with that. The zoning issues, which is tied into legal issues in some way. And then we've partnered with the Rockwall Foundation to do the impacts on the economy and the way we live. And we're going to be partnering with them again to do something on water too much or too little uh, coming up uh, next uh, spring. So why is this a concern and why is this sort of coming up more and more in the communities? Um, well, we have had 30 federal disaster emergency and major disaster declarations since 1950. Half of them have occurred uh, since 2004. 
of the nine major disaster declarations in the past 20 years, half of them have occurred in the past five years. So you can see that this is becoming more and more frequent, and it's something we're really going to have to address. And in fact, we are overdue for a hurricane. We haven't had a hurricane in quite a while. Does anybody know when the last hurricane that hit Connecticut was? And what, what it was? Well, I'll just shout it out there. Glorious, Bob. Bob in 91. Bob in 91. There you go. Yeah. Um, so, so that's what? 25 years since we've had a hurricane, and we're due for one. And you can see some of the impacts that tropical storms have had. The other thing we're getting a lot more of is uh, intense, and that's the key word there, is intense rainstorms and snowstorms that are happening 85% more often than in 1948. And what does that cause? More frequent flooding. And one of the reasons we're having more frequent flooding is because we're getting these things called rain bombs. It's a term that's been coined. I'm not sure it's uh, exactly accurate, but it does describe what's happening. And probably the best example of that is uh, something that happened in New York in two years ago when uh, an inch of rain, less than an inch of rain, fell in Central Park. Three inches of rain fell at Kennedy Airport and 13 inches of rain fell in uh, the middle of Long Island. That's a distance of only 15 miles. So you can see what's happening is we're getting these sort of localized uh, bursts of, um, of rain that are occurring. Another example of that is three inches of rain in 40 minutes in Torrington. Um, and stormwater systems can't handle that. They weren't designed to handle that sort of thing. And these are coming more and more frequently, and it's going to be a bigger and bigger problem for those municipalities that have stormwater systems. In fact, uh, around the office, we, we think that um, dealing with major stormwater systems and sewer systems are the uh, sort of the Darth Vader of <coughs> what's going to be coming up. And fortunately, we have a team at CLEAR um, that has been contracted with the State Department of Environmental Protection, excuse me, the State Department of Energy and Environmental Protection, still can't get used to that, um, uh, to deal with the new MS4 regulations. And uh, they're going to be going out and helping communities deal with stormwater and uh, stormwater systems and how to comply with the new MS4 regulations. What is that result of a lot if you have combined storm sewer and sewer systems? Millions of gallons of, of water, of, uh, raw sewage flowing into Long Island Sound. Um, during Tropical Storm Irene, storm surge came within a foot of the Norwalk Wastewater Treatment Plant, Greater New Haven Water Pollution Control Authority told the state's two storm, storm panel that 15 of its company's wastewater treatment plants lost power. And you lose power in a uh, wastewater treatment plant. And um, not to be too graphic, but it does cause problems upstream. So if you can't flush your toilet, it's a real problem. What does that mean during Tropical Storm Sandy? 11 billion gallons of sewage flowed into surface waters because of storm sewer. Storm water overflowing into uh, uh, sewage treatment plants. In Connecticut, you probably can't see it there, was a modest uh, 24.1 million gallons of water, of raw sewage going into Long Island Sound during just this one storm. And one of the problems is, as I mentioned, is that we're using old standards. The current standards that we're using even right now for sizing of stormwater systems and sizing of stormwater pipes are what are referred to as the TP40 standards or technical paper 40. And that was put out in 1961. Well, a lot of things have changed since 1961. But even if we go to the new standards that are being developed at Cornell for rainwater amounts um, and put in new systems, we size pipes for the new rainwater uh, amounts that are coming in. That works well for the time that the water is in the new pipes. But what happens is it's getting goes back into the old system in the pipes that are not sized for that volume of water, and we get backups. So it's a huge problem. I don't think anybody at this point really knows what to do about it. Um, it may just be that at some point uh, when streets flood, we're just going to put up detour signs to get around because it's billions of dollars to think about dealing with digging up all these systems and putting in new size of pipes. 
storm surge, another issue. 67,000 homes in Connecticut are at risk for hurricane storm surge. We rank 14th in the nation among the state's 100 threats from storm surge on the coast. Just give you an idea of what that looks like when we combine it with sea level rise and storm surge in an area like this. It's probably what the result would be. And when we have these high valued homes on the shoreline, excuse me, I got ahead of myself. Um, another problem we found out that I didn't even consider was septic system failure and well water contamination. Amongst a lot of the smaller communities or the beach communities on the shore, um, rising groundwater is causing septic system failures. Um, well water is being contaminated with the septic system failures as well as with salt, saltwater infiltration from uh, water coming, uh, seawater coming. Uh, and just because nature loves balance, now we're in a drought. The entire state of Connecticut is in drought conditions with the eastern part of the state uh, being in a moderate drought and the western part of the state being in severe drought. Warmer water temperatures is causing habitat changes. Uh, we're apparently catching fish that are normally caught off the coast of Georgia and Florida in Long Island Sound. Um, lobsters are moving out, and they had enough of a problem in the 90s with some sort of a die off. But now, with the warmer water and the cold water species, they're moving out. Blue crabs are moving in. Which, from my perspective, is not a bad thing since I like blue crabs better than I like lobsters. But it's also causing uh, problems for uh, industry. And uh, in 2012, Millstone 2, unit number two, had to shut down because the cooling water that they uh, were bringing in uh, was above 75 degrees. And according to their license, that was the maximum amount that they could have for cooling water in order to um, mark, operate within the safety margin required by their license. So this is a big problem. And what do you do if you have to shut down a sewage treatment plant because water's getting warmer instead of continuing with water? Well, the millstone solution was pretty simple. We're just going to raise the temperature by which we can bring cooling water into 80 degrees. But it's not always going to be that easy for everything. Um, coastal erosion problems we still have, and that's going to cause a loss of tax base. We have all these expensive homes on the real estate. Just give you an idea of what this is like in Westbrook, the small section of Westbrook right there. We did a, a, a little analysis of the per square foot value of real estate in that area. And that's what it looks like. Obviously, with the taller buildings being the higher value of real estate. So you can see if it turns out because of storm surge and sea level rise, that a lot of these uh, uh, high value real estate are going to be lost, it's going to cause an impact on the community's real estate uh, tax base. One of the, the things that I talked about before, and I, I want to focus in a little bit on, is uh, a seminar that we held called The Legal Issues of, uh, in the Age of Climate Adaptation, where we got a bunch of lawyers together, which is always a risky proposition, and, um, had the, and they, they were uh, experts in areas of uh, a bunch of different areas, which I will get into in just a second, uh, and we had them address uh, what they knew about uh, climate change Issues, real legal issues related to climate change. But before I get into that, no discussion of legal issues of climate change would be complete without a review of the attack of the climate change maggots. Now, this is an actual article that was in the Washington Post. I'm going to focus in on here on the cost of climate change because that's what this is all going to come down to, is what things cost and what the impacts are related to cost. But this is a story about um, the fact that on a regular basis now, because of these more intense storms, sewage is backing up into a lot of people's uh, houses in certain neighborhoods in Chicago. And this is a family, the Burns, who three times in five years had, had sewage back up their, into their basement. And of course, they did what anybody would do, which would be to file a claim with their insurance company. Well, Travelers Insurance decided that they had, had or excuse me, Farmers Insurance decided that they had had enough of paying out these claims and sued the city of Chicago for failing to prepare for the effects of global warming. In fact, what they did was uh, farmers alleged that the city of Chicago should have known that climate change 
has resulted in greater rainfall volume than the pre-1970 and done something about it. And this is my favorite part. They further claimed that the storms are not an act of God, but a carbon-driven reality outlined in Chicago's own climate action plan. So this is sort of at odds with some of the things that are happening at the national level now, some of the folks that are being appointed about whether or not carbon is really having an impact. And this was probably a publicity stunt on the part of Farmers Insurance. They eventually dropped the lawsuit. But I think what they're doing is signaling the fact that there are issues out here that really need to be addressed by municipalities, and they're not going to be easy to address. And the big question is, who's going to pay? Like I said, I think this is all going to come down to numbers about who's going to be responsible. And in the case of a lot of this flooding, it's the National Flood Insurance Program. And some fun facts about the, from FEMA about the National Flood Insurance Program, <coughs> it's become the second largest fiscal liability the U.S. government behind Social Security, which is a scary thought. So when we had these attorneys come in, we had attorneys that are specialists in the areas of municipal liability and takings, public trust doctrine, ownership of accreted, uh, and that's not accredited, which I had up there until this morning, <laughs> uh, eroded parcels, zoning and tax issues, permitting, because there's overlapping jurisdictions between local and state permitting, and impacts on real estate values. And there is a lot of uncertainty, again, the uncertainty out there about the resolution of these legal issues uh, because there's a little precedent of case law dealing with it. And that's one of the things we're trying to get out ahead of. And in fact, we're working with the Sea Grant Law Center, which is based at Roger Williams University, to try and answer a lot of the questions that were raised at this workshop. We, had, we asked people to write down their questions and put them in a box before lunchtime so we could have a panel of attorneys afterwards who pulled some of the questions out at random and asked them and had the panel of attorneys address them. We had 57 questions from 100 people. And in fact, we had to shut down the registration for this at 100 because the room wouldn't hold anymore. And I think we had 30 people in the waiting list to come to this. So it's clearly a topic of interest. Some of the questions about municipal liability. Is there a legal liability for a town identifying properties that may be flooded in the future by sea level rise in a coastal resilience plan? So supposing you identify in your coastal resilience plan of municipality that this area is going to be flooded in the future. Can somebody then, and that, and that impacts real estate value, can somebody then come back and say, that's a taking. You reduced my the value of my property because you have now included it in an area that's shown as being flooding that's not officially adopted by the state or by the National Flood Insurance Program. And that's a, sort of the second part of that question is, what standard do we need to have? You know, what level of proof do we need to have of future flooding in order to be address these kinds of issues in a regulatory manner and to make specific site decisions about on, for land use and regulations. Another question, if mean high tidewater moons inland, should taxes also decrease? Sure, if you have less property, should it? Should town change your zoning regulations so that they measure a lot area from the coastal jurisdiction line instead of the tie line and the inside water line, you can see the overlap of coastal jurisdictions there. Another question about property line changes. If it's an evulsive event, that does not change property lines. Well, gradual erosion or accretion does. Did you know it right? All right, so. <laughs> um, so if a hurricane severely erodes its property, do you need a permit to fill it back in to where it was because your property line hasn't changed? Um, and how does it also affect Coastal jurisdiction line. Coastal jurisdiction line is determined by elevation. So if at some point the coastal jurisdiction line says the elevation is 2.1 feet, and then some storm comes in and wipes out a whole bunch of area, that coastal jurisdiction line is going to move, which also raises questions about permitting. If you've gotten a permit based on a coastal jurisdiction line that happens to be at this area, and then a whole bunch of uh, sand is washed in from a storm, now the coastal jurisdiction line is here, when you go to put in another permit, is the permit based on the original coastal jurisdiction line where you had your, you know, your original permit, or is it now a new one? So it moves around, and what are the questions on that? And here's an idea just to show you some of the issues. Right here, this is from 1934, um, and that area of Westbrook, where you can see in this area right here, there's a bunch of what appear to be lots 
that aren't there. And in this area up here, there's lots that extend all the way out to the water line. Well, a groin was put in up here, which has impacted the property here. So now we have these lots that used to be here. All that has moved down there. So another question is, is there a liability? Can these people sue whoever put that in? Because the land has been eroded. Another question. I used to have a lot that was big enough for me to put an addition on under the zoning regulations. Now, because it's been eroded away, it's smaller. To, and it's, let's say it's, it's less than the zoning requirements. Am I now allowed to put an addition on? Or am I grandfathered on based on the, on the uh, original size of the lot? <clears throat> we don't really have answers to these things right now. So another question that's, that's really in the, in the uh, forefront of the zoning issues right now. The state of Connecticut has established a program that allows people to um, get a low interest loan to raise their housing stock. FEMA has said they want everybody to raise their housing mm -hmm. stock. And that seems to be the, the prevailing thinking of the way to get around this problem of coastal flooding on properties. Um, but all zoning regulations have a height restriction in it, and usually for residential properties, it's 30 to 35 feet. A lot of the houses on the shoreline, they're very, very close to that. So if you're gonna raise it up anywhere between three and 10 feet or whatever it is, you're gonna violate the uh, height restrictions in the zoning regulations. There's a thing called a variance, which allows you to violate the zoning regulations in certain cases if there's a hardship. So I sent out something on planner's listserv and said, with two parts. One, has your uh, community been granting variances for um, uh, people raising their property above the height limitation? And two, is it a hardship or isn't it a hardship? And I got that what I expected. They've approved applications for variances. <laughs> They've denied applications for variances. They're enacting new regulations. It is a hardship. It is a hardship. <laughs> and so this is probably going to require some sort of a legislative fix because we really do need to have consistency in something like zoning all across the state. You can have some communities saying, yeah, it's okay to do it, and other communities saying, no, it's not. Um, so that's another area. Talk about the impacts on real estate values. There's recently uh, the, the town of Stonington is coming through resilience plan, which shows what's going to be flooded during storm surge and um, uh, sea level rise. And that goes back to the question about, is there a liability now here on the part of the town of Stonington? We don't think there is because it's a planning document, but it's, there's a, probably a political issue that's going to be coming up. There's going to be some political consequences from doing this. Um, but the, the writer of this article said, I suspect that the maps are soon going to be a resource for anyone buying or selling real estate since flood vulnerability has already become a factor in property values. Recently, the New York Times came up with something. If you're buying a home, will you consider climate change? And I think this quote is really interesting. No one knows when or if a panic may sit in among insurance companies, lenders, or home buyers, one that causes prices to fall and never recover in vulnerable areas. It's a big issue. We don't know what's happening. It's a big enough issue that you can see signs like this. It's become a marketing thing if you don't have to get flood insurance. And we could go into the whole issue of real estate values and the National Flood Insurance Program with the uh, uh, recent legislation that was passed and then rescinded at Congress about trying to make the National Flood Insurance Program um, based, the premiums based on risk. It raised some people's premiums from like $3,000 to $23,000 made some properties unsaleable. Congress quickly reversed that for the Flood Insurance Affordability Act, but at some point, flood insurance premiums are going to have to be risk-based. So we had, as I said, a whole bunch of questions. We're working with the Sea uh, Grant Law Center to answer some of those questions. Um, if you go to the website, there'll be a list of the questions on there, uh, climate.ucon.edu. Go down to the bottom where it's identification of legal issues, and we hope to have the responses we're getting from the Sea Grant Center uh, up there in the next uh, month or so. And with that, I will turn it over to Joel. Thank you. So one of the things that you can see from what Bruce has said is that there's all these conflicts between the natural resources, the people who are living in these areas, private property rights, and so we're starting to get into that. And, and so you can see here 
here, so this is in Waterford. Um, beach is right here. This is an exposed septic system. Um, this was after Irene, okay? Um, and this is down in, in the Milford area. Again, here's your seawall. The wave's hitting it. And so everybody wants to protect their infrastructure, whether it's roads, the railroad lines, um, or their homes, right, or businesses. So you've got a nice beach, right? Lots of wildlife. You put in a seawall, and as waves hit the beach, hit that seawall, it's eroding out the beach. So over time, you basically lose your beach and, and all the wildlife that might be using that. This is, has already happened. There are many areas in Connecticut um, that you can go back to the old area of photography, you can see a beach, they put in a seawall, and even at low tide, there's a little to no beach, okay? So there's, there's solutions like hard structures, but there are consequences to those, okay? So um, there's lots of groups coming up with lots of ideas on, on how do you protect infrastructure, control erosion, um, and so you've got your traditional shoreline stabilization. These are all called hard structures or gray solutions, and they gray, they, they gray down to green solutions where you're using natural features, basically, to control erosion. So these are called living shorelines, which has become one of the really um, big areas in Connecticut. Living shoreline is using natural features to control erosion, basically. So, so here you see an eroding salt marsh, and this is using uh, core logs, or coconut fiber logs, um, that are put into place that can be planted and slowly control erosion. Um, this is called a hybrid living shoreline design where you're using some rock combined with natural features. So the way this works, it, it's the whole idea is to slow down wave energy, not, not in a major storm event. We're just talking regular waves over time. So they, the waves slow down, they might go over this, the water slow down, sediment gets deposited, marsh plants can grow, so you're widening that marsh essentially and protecting the area landward of it. Um, these are called reef falls. This is another technique um, in the WAD category, wave attenuation devices. Um, this is in Stratford, Connecticut, at the Audubon property. It's really cool. Um, it's worth seeing. These have been used for a very long time down in Florida. Um, this is the first installation of these in Connecticut. And the idea, again, is that you put in these structures, they're, they're anchored down, um, and this is all being done by Sacred Heart University, by the way. They got a grant, and they're, they're monitoring it, they've got students involved. Um, so the waves hit these, slow down, sediment starts to accumulate behind it, um, and they've done a really, really great job here in terms of um, uh, doing some additional plantings, um, they're measuring sediment accretion, they're, they're trying to see what's happening with these. So, so these have holes in them so that at high tide, when these might be you know, covered at least partially, fish can go in and out, um, some organisms settle on these. Lots of things going on here. Um, in this situation, they seem to be working well. Um, they've survived a number of nor'easter events they've been in, I think it's three years now. Um, and they just got a grant to put in a whole bunch more. Um, but again, you have to be very careful. They're not gonna work everywhere. And that's a big question on our Connecticut shoreline, which as anybody who's gone to the shore knows, it's incredibly varied, right? We don't have miles of beach like they do in New Jersey or North Carolina, right? We just don't have that here. Um, so where they will work is a huge question. Um, and the reason is even looking at these different shoreline stabilization techniques is because of Connecticut Public Act 12-101. And there are a lot of things in this, but basically it says that you can use hard structure when there's no feasible, less environmentally damaging alternative. What is that? Well, that means that you can either relocate, you can retreat, nobody wants to do that. You can elevate 
which has its whole own host of issues. You can restore or create some sort of natural habitat, or you can use living shorelines. So Public Act 12, this came out, we didn't, as so often happens, legislation was way ahead of reality, right? We didn't have a working definition for living shorelines in Connecticut. There's a NOAA definition that the state said, well, you know, kind of, you can use this. So, so basically there was a huge need and all of a sudden municipalities had to look at what are these living shoreline things. So um, we teamed up with the state um, with a, a consulting firm, a coastal um, engineering consulting firm, and put together a series of workshops that, that tried to bring this topic to light, explain what they are, where they might be able to be used, what are issues with them, pros and cons. Um, this is Sandy Crislow. Some of you may remember him. Um, he was with UConn Extension for a while. Um, and he's now the environmental planner down in Old Saybrook. So it's nice to be able to, to work with him. Um, so we, we had a panel in this situation of a couple coastal engineers, a couple of um, municipal officials, um, brought in federal speakers, you know, people who have been doing it for years down in Maryland, uh, who had decades of experience with, with uh, living shorelines. Um, and there's still so many more issues to deal with. And one of the biggest ones is you have our, our coastal engineers and our homeowners who feel very safe with, with hard structures, with a seawall, right? And so what many of the engineers are doing, it's like, well, here's a pile of rocks, I'm gonna put some plants on them, it's a living shoreline. And the state comes and says, absolutely not. And, and so a huge amount of money is being spent by homeowners going back and forth with the permitting alone, okay? Um, and sometimes they actually get put in, and the state says, no, way too much rock, take it all out, okay? Um, so, so we're really trying to help explore this issue, um, both from the state side, and the permitting side, and the homeowner side, and the engineering side. One, one of the big issues that was raised in the very first Living Shoreline uh, workshop that we did um, was ice. So it's like, sure, these things work great down in Virginia, Maryland. They don't have the ice issues that we have up here. So we brought in an expert who'd been uh, doing many of these types of applications for the Great Lakes. And, and that was really helpful for the consultants to hear you know, what was going on here. So those are the sorts of things we're trying to address. So the last Living Shoreline uh, uh, program that we did was a, um, a design threat. I had never done anything like this. Um, Bruce too, um, so it was really scary kind of going into it. And the idea was to put teams together. We gave them nine scenarios. Um, we took all the registrants, we asked them what their background was, and we put teams together of people with varied backgrounds. We tried to have an engineer with a planner, maybe with a landscape architect, um, a consultant. So we really tried to put these groups together so that each table had a range of, of backgrounds. And then the idea was um, to go out with your team and spend some time on your scenario and come up with a design. Those designs were then presented to a panel and the panel included federal, state, and local municipal um, uh, permitters so that they could provide feedback on these designs that people had come up with so that start to get a better sense of what would and would not be permitted. We ended up having, I think it was over two and a half, three hours of discussion, and, and I actually had to cut it off. Um, so, so there's room for so much more. We were, we were so fortunate, it was an absolutely beautiful day. The state was able to get us Harkness, the, the mansion at Harkness Memorial State Park for free. So there were a lot of really interesting things that came out of this. Uh, Mariah is working with us on some evaluation um, of using this type of a design charrette to try to move this forward instead of just having another workshop, basically. Okay, so Climate Adaptation Academy, as with all things, has more. Thanks to Bruce for finding this. Um, and he mentioned uh, the website.
website, um, climate at UConn.edu. And so we have, we have moved forward with something that we're calling ADAPT-CT. Um, this is our new website that now includes the Climate Adaptation Academy, something called the Climate Core, um, information, basically resources, whether it's websites, the fact sheets um, from the legal program, and um, information on coastal habitats. And I just want to point out the ADAPT-CT name um, was something that um, our intern over the summer came up with. And he actually contributed a lot to both photographs and um, putting together resources. So it was great. So there he is. Um, um, so what I want to tell you a little bit about is the Yukon Climate Corps. And um, uh, kudos to Chet Arnold, who is the PI on a, um, on a provost academic plan grant that's making this possible. It is very much um, an inter-college, interdepartmental, all these different groups being involved. And the whole idea is to um, provide resources to municipalities with students. So it's workforce development, um, and hopefully municipalities will gain quite a bit as well. And so Bruce mentioned, municipalities really need data. There's so much information out there. How can you possibly choose which sea level rise model to use, right? Just as one example, given um, the different issues that a particular town might have, what, what models are there? What policies could they possibly put into place? How much is it gonna cost? How can you phase in different options? And again, just keeps coming back to money. So, just by way of a couple of examples, Bruce mentioned the septic systems. Um, how do you deal with that? Or road flooding, right? Every, every coastal town just about now experiences road flooding somewhere just during high tide. Forget a storm, right? Just during high tide because of sea level rise. And it is really expensive to elevate a road. Not only that, why does it flood? It's flooding because you probably have tidal wetland on one if not both sides, right? So when you elevate a road, you usually have to make it wider. So then you're impacting tidal wetlands. So it just snowballs. And it comes down to, like Bruce said, you know, we're just gonna let some areas flood. Where are we gonna make the choices? And it comes down to risk management. I know Joe does a lot of work with risk management in terms of agriculture, and there's another application of that. So um, what, we're, what we're hoping to do is, is have the students um, be able to work with the municipalities and it's going to require from the mayor, the first selectman or woman, you know, through every single department because climate impacts everything, whether it's health and mosquitoes, you know, or, or public works and flooding. And most of all, it's the local residents, you know, um, making sure that they're on board because they're the ones paying the taxes make these things happen. Um, here's a quote that, that Bruce found. Um, so this is kind of what we're up against, right? Climate change, yeah, okay, might be a problem, but I just can't deal with it right now. There's, you know, our education budget, our, all these other budgets that are affecting me now. Climate, well, that I can put off, right? The climate issues. So here's where we're headed. Um, we're going to be teaching a course, um, hopefully to juniors and seniors in the fall of 2017, that's really going to be different, um, I hope, than, than uh, courses that are already taught on campus that, that certainly teach about climate, um, what's climate change at a, you know, local, at a international scale, what's going on with it. So we're really going to focus in on what's happening in this area, um, and we're only focused on adaptation not on mitigation, um, which is the lessening of the um, greenhouse gas emissions. And those students, one of the things that they're gonna get out of the course is how to do a vulnerability assessment. And then we'll have teams of students who are gonna work with specific towns 
We already have a number of towns who are saying, yes, we really want you guys to come in. We want students to work with us. Um, and basically do a service learning project with the community. Um, so, you know, we're, we're still trying to figure out exactly, but basically, you know, it could be working on a vulnerability assessment in a particular neighborhood, and then coming up with <coughs> solutions, practical <coughs> solutions. So what are policy options that a community could put into their plan of conservation and development tomorrow so that they're actually starting to move forward? There's a huge number of groups that are, you know, working with communities to do vulnerability assessments, um, and a lot of those plans are sitting on shelves. And I don't mean just in Connecticut, I mean across the country. Because then it's like, oh, it's too expensive, we can't do this. So hopefully, what the students will be able to do is come up with options, regardless of cost, right? And then the cost can be factored in, um, and I think very much so trying to come up with um, a gradation of how these things might be put in over time. So that's the kind of uh, core. Um, and we have more uh, climate adaptation uh, academy sessions uh, coming up for next year. Um, we're working on another project that has to do with evacuation mapping and story maps. Um, we're going to be continuing our work with municipalities on you know, one on one going and dealing with various issues. And just real quickly, um, a rapid response team. And I know this is something that Bonnie has brought up to deal with like agricultural emergencies. So let me back up. So after Sandy, um, all these calls, after, after People's Power was back yet, so we're a couple weeks into the aftermath, and all these people are calling up and saying, ah, oh, you know, our beach are doomed like that. What do we do? Should we, should we just push the sand back? Should we replant? I can't find plants anymore. You know, where do I get the beach grass to replant? What should we do? And so, um, and Sandy Crislow actually was, was one of these and, and um, offered up his town hall. And we got all these groups together. So we basically had 13 towns or private beach associations came together and they each had like two minutes to say, here's, here's what happened, here's what my issue is. And we were able to bring in um, let's see, we had the federal agencies, so we had FEMA, we had Army Corps of Engineers, we had U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and NOAA represented, and then the state was represented, um, and then obviously all the local municipalities. And, and so the state said, there's a temporary authorization, you have until whatever it was, February 15th, you can push all the sand back that you want. Don't need a permit, don't need anything. As soon as there's a piping plover on that property, you have to stop, right? The little endangered bird that uses beach habitat. Um, and so everybody's like, oh great, okay, we're good to go. And the poor guy from Army Corps of Engineers is there in the back raising his hand saying, wait a minute guys, a lot of this sand got pushed into tidal wetlands. We have a plan in tidal wetlands. You cannot Army Corps finds people and municipalities who do things without their authorization. And so and he and he made it so easy. But but that meeting was so critical because you have to have the state saying, sure, just go right ahead, you've got a temporary authorization, it's no problem at all. And there's the federal government saying, no, no, no. Okay. So, so that's just an example of having some sort of a team that can put together these quick meetings. It was just a half day, I think, but a lot of questions got answered. And we're seeing debris removal as coming, coming up as a huge issue, whether it's coastal or inland towns. Um, FEMA regulations keep changing. Do you know, do you know what towns had to do after Sandy to clear debris? In order to get reimbursed, they had to have a photo and a GPS location for every tree that was cut. Okay? And, and, and the regulations keep changing. I've 
questions? some areas where we do see, and uh, in, in the area of debris removal, where some municipalities are starting to get together because it makes sense. Yeah. Um, but I wouldn't say that it is widespread. And, you know, one example, so Bruce had, had mentioned that um, uh, emergency preparation and technology workshop that we did, and we did one in the eastern part of the state and one in the western, and this was in between our name and Sandy, okay? And, um, the little towns have a budget of maybe $4,000 for GIS, maybe. And the big towns have got 100000 And the emergency manager from Old Line, he was like, guys, I've got a small budget. Could you please help me out? Could we share resources? You know, so that they were making the pitch themselves. Yeah, okay. yeah. I was going to ask you one more about that, that climbing core. Mm -hmm. Is that the same? service learning component of that course or is that going to be uh, something like an internship opportunity? So so it's two things. Two so things? so okay. the, the students have to take the class course. Okay. Um, and then in the fall, hopefully a subset of those students will want to do the service learning component, which is where they will then spend the semester working in the community. Okay. But, you know, for, okay. for credit. Okay. Yeah. One of the, the biggest problems with municipalities doing resiliency plans or climate adaptation mm -hmm. plans or whatever you want to call them uh, is the fact that there's an enormous amount of time involved in identifying vulnerabilities and um, uh, nobody, none of the, the planners, the staff, the, the folks that are there, the public works directors really have the time to go out and spend that time determining which things are vulnerable, which of course is the first step. You need to know what's vulnerable and why before you can figure out what you can do about it. And so, um, and the communities that are doing vulnerability assessments or uh, resiliency plans are the ones that have gotten these $150,000 Sandy grants that have come in. Not everybody has $150,000 to hire a consultant to go out and do that. And in fact, now there's going to be even less money coming out of the federal government to do something So these like students will have a, a kind of a skill set that they'll be able to go down. They'll have a skill set. Offer up something of value. And, and, and what we're doing is we're creating a template Actually, we have created a template. Um, we work with an intern over the summer, a very great intern over the summer. And we've created this template for information that's needed to determine vulnerability. Mm -hmm. uh, things like whether it's vulnerable, you know, the, the elevation, uh, its location, whether it's vulnerable to sea level rise or flooding from the stream or things like that. And what the students will do, and you know, quite frankly, instead of like the olden days where you had to go out and, and look or go on the site, student in their pajamas in their dorm room <laughs> can fill out a lot of this information that's needed to determine what the vulnerability is. And so that's sort of the idea is that we have these templates. Each of these sites will then have the vulnerability identified by the student. And we're going to have a list of possible solutions ranging everywhere from do nothing to doing something that's very expensive. And we're going to then pair the vulnerability with the list of solutions and give that to the town and say, look, we're not deciding which of the solutions you should pick here. That's your job to decide that. But now you have the information you need in order to make a decision about what you're gonna do about this stuff. We know it's vulnerable, we know why it's vulnerable. Here's what you can do about it and you gotta decide. And that's sort of the concept behind it is students can do a lot of this, collect a lot of this information that normally has been farmed out to Towns that don't have the money to hire consultants. And, and you know what's interesting? So the town of Stonington got one of those big Sandy grants, right? And they had a big town meeting, and I was talking to someone who, who went to that meeting, 
and the consulting firm came in and you know they're super they've got super computer time to, to do their flood models and all that and and the, the poor guy the kid who lives in the borough he's like i know my property's flooded i want to know what to do do i move now do i sell Always interesting. Thank you very much. Once again, <laughs> you do not disappoint. This is a very uh, informative.